Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in again. I am Kaylee Bateman, the Content Director at She Can Code, and today we are discussing how to get the most out of networking events. We're going to delve into the art of networking and why it's so important with my special guests for today, Lauren James and Amy Lee from Spectrum IT Recruitment, and they also run Women in Tech Hampshire, so we're going to touch upon that a little bit today as well. Welcome Lauren and Amy. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much for joining me. I know you both have well, incredible, uh, incredibly busy day jobs and also other things that you do on the side. So we're going to uh, delve into that a little bit today. Can I start off with a bit of background about each of you to set the context for our audience, please? Um, Amy, should we start with you? Yeah, of course. So I obviously work in IT recruitment here at Spectrum. So I've been here Oh, it's nine years this year. Eight and a half, nine? Yeah, nine years this year. So that's as it's flown by. Um, a loyal employee. <laughs> loyal for yeah, nine years. I know. Yeah, so I initially worked in healthcare recruitment after university. And then I just wanted something that was a bit more, I guess, kind of diverse. So tech is an industry that was never going to die. It's really interesting, always changing. So it keeps you on your toes. So I was like, actually, that fits really well with what I'm looking for. Um, yeah, that's basically how I fell into my version of tech. So, so many ladies say they fall into tech, but uh, there are not many that, that plan, unfortunately, to come in, um, which we're trying to change. But yeah, most most ladies have fallen into the industry. Lauren, did you fall in or did you have a plan for the tech industry? I hate to be another one that kind of fell into it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I was like, I, you know, I, again, I've been with um, Spectrum IT for it's nine years this year. Myself and Amy joined the same year, and so we've been together this, this whole time, seeing each other through. But yeah, no, I, I started off as an office administrator when I joined here, um, you know, helping with the, the kind of paperwork and, and payments and, you know, the back office style things. And then through various projects, um, data migrations, uh, new system like implementations, bits and pieces of my roles developed, and now I um deal with the uh, socials the marketing um i did compliance i did with admin just many fingers in many pies essentially but that's the one support that's that's, yeah support what is a lot of um if, if systems go down straight away people come to me <laughs> for a little bit of help um yeah so it's so, so i'm not really i'm not really in tech myself so i'm in the, you know the tech industry with, with um with spectrum here but and i guess i have to be a bit tech savvy supporting oh. with with all the systems and, and the stuff that I've done. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a uh, falling into, but yeah, I love it. I've spent nine years. Oh, I can't think of anything else really at the moment. <laughs> that's fun. Don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's quite a career so far, um, if you've been at a company nine years. Um, what about your involvement with Women in Tech Hampshire? What Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So obviously working here for nine years or so, I think I've always, as obviously we place candidates into positions and it's really quite shocking when you look at it at the end of the year and you're like, actually, such a small percentage of people that I've placed into roles are women. And it's very rare that, particularly at the start of my career, that I would have many women candidates at all. Like I'd go a week without speaking to a female like software developer or software support or anything. And we... Just found it really, really frustrating, to be honest. So it's something that we've wanted to do for quite a while, but it's just getting the right bearings and the right footing to actually get into it in terms of, okay, so how do we actually go about this in terms of encouraging more women into tech? Because we see it all across STEM, it's not just tech. Mm. And a lot of the issues are actually wider than just tech as well. It's, it's global, basically. It's across every kind of sector. Um, but yeah, so we initially actually went to an event in Bournemouth, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so Women Tech Bournemouth, um, so that was it through, yeah, yeah. Dorset. Dorset. Um, so that was through Seaman, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. Seaman Larry. Oh, she's been on the podcast. Yes, yes we are a supporter of Women in Tech Dorset. Yes. Yes, she's <laughs> wonderful. Oh, sorry. So uh, we actually sponsored some of their events and then they basically gave us some tips because we were like, there's nothing really down in Hampshire. There's not a lot going on mm. with regards to women in tech. Well, that's easy to find. That was the biggest thing. Yeah. You know, there, there's the odd kind of hackathons or coding groups, which is actually fantastic, but you know, there's like sporadic. Yeah, yeah, sweet, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, they were really, really helpful, gave us kind of loads of tips in terms of, I don't know, how to obviously engage with Shotty EU. That was very useful. Yep. <laughs> um, but also in terms of actually kind of setting up the event, uh, we were initially quite worried that, you know, will people actually be interested in coming? Are there enough women, low people yeah. to actually come? But yeah, it was uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, I think it was, there's so many, one of the things that we spoke about as well is, is that education piece for, for, for clients as well, because I've had conversations kind of outside of work, and I think you've had conversations with, with persons, and like, oh yeah, we, we need to hire more women. It's like, oh, cool. why? They're like, well, just because everyone is. It's like, no, no, it's no, yeah, it's not the best place to start yeah. from. <laughs> um, but it's also then having that, then you get people that are willing and want to mm -hmm. learn, and, and, and I've had discussions with like friends, and as soon as you get into it, they're like, oh, I actually didn't know about that. Okay, it's really interesting. So it's that enlightening piece, that education piece, having the discussion. Yeah, yeah, it's making people aware, really, so, yeah. Yeah, Amy, you just said that you know what we we held something we didn't know whether the ladies would come along, yeah. and they do. There there is an avenue there. They're just mm -hmm. the ladies are crying out for places to meet and network and and um, to join communities. And you are right. I think people uh, people are thinking, well, you know, there aren't many ladies. Will they connect? And actually, they're just that's that's what they're looking for a platform to be able to do that um so it's great that when when you did launch that uh that ladies did turn up and um and it just grows and grows from there well that's when we had to actually expand on the tickets didn't we because yeah. we, we were like oh well you know we'll do this amount and then that kind of surpassed and then we had to add a few more on and then we were getting emails from people saying oh, i've missed out tickets can i come along so we had we had so much and we, we did a, a, a feedback survey afterwards just to get some um feedback from the people that attended and they just loved the fact that there was this in-person community that they could attend now a lot of the women that actually um came along were remote workers so they don't they didn't they don't have those colleagues you know sitting next to them they can just bounce ideas off share things with they are on their own and they appreciated that as a way of meeting kind of like-minded people mm. um but yeah it was just just building up and, and you know realizing oh okay there are other women doing the same role as me oh i can have a chat with them or i can talk to them for advice if they're so that's really nice yeah yeah uh, everyone was just so forthcoming with it as well it wasn't like an awkward silence you know you're going into a room and you don't know anyone and it's it's horrible isn't it normally when you think of it mm -hmm. but everyone's just straight away just beelining for each other and that yeah is not something that i've seen before we have quite a few like networking events and normally it's a lot of people just sit around in the corner right. and you get a few huddles yeah. together. Yeah. But yeah. Like, everyone just, yeah, yeah. Tend to embrace it. That's the thing. It actually, it wasn't like it was lots of people from various places coming. Everyone was essentially individual, weren't they? Mm -hmm. That was there, that were there on their own. So they were there all for the same reason. So yeah, it was, it was refreshing to see. Yeah. I think as well, we we had a discussion um, on the podcast recently about not just sharing the good stories amongst each other as well, but sharing when things have gone bad and, and advice as to, you know, what you wish you'd done differently. And you always have those ladies that it's great to see things on Instagram and, you know, people's lives going wonderful. You have those LinkedIn posts of, I never thought when I started my business a year ago, my life would look like this. That's fantastic. But we also want to hear... Every time that a business has failed, every time that you've gone somewhere and you wish you hadn't moved to that company or, you know, something project went wrong, because that is far more helpful than yeah. just the success stories. Well, it's, it's what they say, isn't it, that um, people are more likely to write you know, negative reviews than they are positive reviews because they want to kind of share that anger, that anger emotion. emotion, that emotion, exactly, that emotion yeah. with other people. I think that's like so valuable to share the flip side of it the big thing we spoke about was imposter syndrome as well wasn't it so, mm -hmm. that people brought up you know and the amount of people that were it was i think we did a show of hands didn't we? in the room it was like who in this room has had imposter syndrome at one point in life and i don't think i saw a hand i don't know if i saw a hand now no i think if i did they're in the back you know yeah. so and again that's that it's not i guess not a negative but it's a a negative emotion i guess it felt that everyone has been through as well. So it shows that we're all the same, we're human, we've all been through it. Um, yeah. 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 
And so your events, I mean, it sounds like it's it's a, a great environment that's created and that you are, um, it, it sounds like it's a safe environment where you can connect freely with, with um, other people there. Not all events are like that. And some networking events absolutely terrify people and they think it just, it's my worst nightmare going to have to network at an event. Um, do you have any advice for individuals looking to navigate networking events effectively? I personally say, obviously, if you're going to an event, and it is it is a commitment, mm -hmm. so try and think of what you're actually trying to get from that event. Are you trying to just meet people, to network? If so, literally things as easy as just, you know, kind of with you on LinkedIn or what's your name, writing down those names later. And then if you're all a bit too scared to actually speak to these people in person, you've got their details out. Most people wear name tags. You yeah. look up on LinkedIn, be like, hi. Um, saw you were at this event, you know, go from there. So, yeah, there's no one size fits all when it mm. comes to networking. But I think just knowing what you're there for mm. is a good place to start. Absolutely. I think, yeah, if you're, if you're signing up, and this, this will be, I guess, an in-person one, um, yeah, ha have some questions maybe, you know, if it's training or if it's, um, or if it's a panel or whatever. But I think, I think actually that can apply for webinars as well. Because sometimes webinars... Why I actually find webinars more intimidating than in person because of you open it up and you've got like a hundred or like fifty people all on a screen for like everyone. <laughs> Whereas in person, you can kind of everyone blends into each other. So for me, it doesn't feel as intimidating. But like that, like anything, it's not one size fits all. Everyone will have different um, kind of coping, you know, methods for all of that. Um, if you want to go, if you've got a friend, I guess, that you could come and support you, you don't want to go on your own. You know, I used to go to might be like, oh, <laughs> um, and, and then it gets you going, and then you get, you might then build that confidence, and then you be like, actually, I can go on my own now because then you've met people from those communities. Um, and again, so if you ever don't catch people's names, organizing events are normally really forthcoming with the people that have been there. If you want to, if you reach out to organizers, they're not quite helpful in terms of pointing you in the right direction and making connections. Um, yeah. yeah, and I guess, yeah, just sign up to any kind of alerts local. You know, there's so many um, things like Meetup and Eventbrite and as I don't know, but, uh, you know, other, other event platforms are available. Um, <laughs> but they're good to just browse on there as well, see what's local in the area. You sign up to the groups and you get notifications of, of all events. So it's something that you don't miss out on. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah that ties into as well I wanted to ask you about building lasting relationships with the people you meet because say you did meet somebody at a, a networking event you might not follow up with them Amy that great advice even if you're if you're nervous or not nervous just following up with them afterwards surely is so much more valuable than thinking actually four months ago I bumped into some lady can't remember her name or what she does at a networking event it's almost a waste of an evening isn't it like how do you take it from there to building a lasting relationship with with somebody uh so again we think um look at it like speed dating so for example you're not gonna want to connect with every single person that you sat at that table with you know sometimes you're not necessarily gonna like particularly or you just don't have much in common with you know, that's not a bad thing, that is just life. But they're often asked like that one or two people that you're like, actually, I want to know a bit more about them, or you know, there's something quite interesting about them, so I want to know more. Um, so in terms of kind of keeping in contact with them, there's so many platforms around these days, like we've said about mm. from LinkedIn, face to face. Mm. Um, and it's not just down to you. You want this to be reciprocated as well. So, you know, if you have reached out to this person, they might reach out to you. Or it's just kind of getting yourself in their eye a little bit, isn't it? So you might meet them at the next kind of networking event and be like, oh, hi, there you are again. Let's get chatting. So, yeah, there's not a definitive, this is the only way to do it. Just do whatever feels comfortable for you, I think. And I think it's it's also not necessarily going to be, I, I mean, it's like I have it with some friends, for example. You don't see them for but you have a chat to them. It, it's like you've never been apart kind of thing and after every event I mean we, we went to a few last year and I made a note of everyone um that we that, that we thought would be you know quite good um involvement with, with women in Cape Hampshire or one way or the other and then 
connected with them on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I literally I live on LinkedIn. It's <laughs> everything on there. Um, connecting with them, I always send them like, you know, it's lovely to meet you because as well, you've met them, but they probably also met loads of other people. So you have to think about it from that perspective. Um, it's something that I'm comfortable with, you know, reaching out and messaging people, like you said, not everyone will be uh, confident or, 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 you know, feel comfortable in that, and that's fine. Um, but I think that's the biggest kind of way of keeping that relationship going. Um, I, I had, you know, I've had people the other day that I spoke to about about when we first were looking at the Women in Tech Hampshire, I reached out to her, and then she's actually now looking to move to the UK from um, from, you know, from Europe. And she's like, oh, I remember we spoke about Women in Tech. Um, I wonder if you can, you know, chat to me about, about the recruitment over there and stuff like that. So, you know, it started from this one initial thing of one similar interest that we have. She's remembered me from that and then she's thought about me for a completely different um, reason. So you're not going to necessarily keep in contact with these people every day, every week. It, it's just drip feeding now and then um, and just remembering people, I guess, from those common interests. Um, yeah, yeah. If, so, if someone doesn't remember you, yeah, it's not the end of the world. It's hard. I mean, we yeah. attend um, expos, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you do as well. And it is hard when you're meeting hundreds of people that day, and uh, you might switch LinkedIn. And I try to get in the habit of on the train home. If I've connected with people, or I've got names of people. Either connect or ping them a quick message because. It just kind of cements that and it's fresh in your mind. It's in the train home from the show because you're right. A few weeks later, you're going to be like, oh, gosh, I can't remember. What did I want to talk to that lady about? Were we going to partner on something? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I mean, it, it's it's almost keeping that. It's like when you look at the kind of customer, you know, you've you met this person, you're on a high, and then you're keeping them on that high, whereas you, you meet someone and then you don't message them or, or connect or whatever. It then goes down and then... You message them six months later. Oh, okay, they're only going to get back to part way. So that's how they actually. Yeah. You know, it, it's just nice. I, I mean, yeah. everyone's going to be the same. This, well, this is it. Obviously, we've been to quite a few events together, and Lauren has a much <laughs> larger social battery than I do. I find it really, really tiring just trying to remember people's faces, people's names, and hold that conversation for so long. Even if I'm interested, you know, when you've met so many people one day, so overwhelming. It, so I used to do, yeah. and my person thought I used to do events and, and kind of, you know, exhibitions and stuff. So I'm just, I'm really used to it. Whereas we, few things I've been to, and he's like, oh, so excuse me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. on the way back. <laughs> we try and make notes as well if we're doing like big exhibitions and you meet so many people that you forget the names and we try and have a list with notes at least to try and remember what we spoke with that person about and um you know how can we work together in the future because you're right it is exhausting um to to meet so many people um and then follow up with them I mean on that note as well it's it's not always just finding the energy, um, but the the confidence as well. And I mean, you mentioned imposter syndrome previously. What do you have any advice for that overcoming those hurdles? Like, how do you, if you're not that comfortable and you are work, walking into a networking event, do you have any advice for kind of maybe breaking the ice or chatting with somebody, or how do you overcome imposter syndrome? We actually had this discussion, I think, and it was brought up at the launch event. And the biggest thing was saying if whatever your your I, I, I think there are two different things. So imposter syndrome in itself, and then also kind of arriving at events because I think those are two two things. But if your friend came to you and said, you know, oh I don't feel like I could do this, or I don't know if I want to apply for that job, I'm not quite right. Would you let them say, yeah, you're right, actually, no, you're not, you're not good enough. You wouldn't. You'd be like. Stop being silly. You're amazing. Like you've got this. You're overqualified for that. You can do this. And it's how we need to listen to our own advice and actually be like, be our own biggest cheerleader on that and say, no, I am going to give that a go. And and so it is very. It is so people will be listening, and it's like it, that's easier said than done. And again, it's not a one size fits all. But if you think about it that way, and I I can definitely think of times when I've given advice to my friends. And then I've been in that situation and they've come back to me and said, what did you tell me? What did you tell me when I was saying the same to you? 
So it is just massive. It's just listening to your own advice. Yeah. It's, yeah, I think, like you said, it's it's just backing yourself a bit, um, embracing it, really. So I've, since we had that kind of conversation about imposter syndrome at our last event, I've tried to look into it a bit more um, because I've definitely felt it. I'm pretty sure everyone's felt it, but like, oh, this is weird. This is normal. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> I know from what I felt is that seeing it as a negative thing is the worst thing to do. It's yeah. actually a really positive thing because it shows that you have that foresight to know that you can always improve, you can always do better. You're not going to be the smartest person in the room all the time. Mm. That is just life. So it just means you have that continuous improvement. So you're not taking opportunities for granted. You're not just getting stuff handed to you like, yeah. actually, I'm going to go out and make this happen mm. for me. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's a lot about how you frame it in your own mind. Yeah. And it's, it's just really interesting. Like, there's stats where everyone's in that room. Everyone. Mm. Everyone put their hand up. And, stuff. and it, uh, you know, it could be a moment. I've had it with, you know, on engagement and socials. And that, you know, you just suddenly think, no one wants to see that. Oh, no, I don't know. But I, you just you just suddenly, all of a sudden, right. it's amazing. It's, it's this that can come out of nowhere, and then you might see some two days later, it's not supposed to be the exact same thing. Damn it, I, I shouldn't trust in myself. Um, but then going back to what you said about the the you know arriving at networks and um, so arriving at events and networking all that, that I don't know if I have an answer on that. To be honest, I find it really awkward. I'm not going to lie. The mm. events that I've been to, I always just find it awkward. I am just that person. I think, yeah. So. I wouldn't necessarily say oh, I'm an introvert, but I'm just like, there's a lot of people in this room. I don't know where to start. Yeah. What do I do? I went. <laughs> so I used to, I used to hate arriving places on my younger. When I say younger, I mean when I would go out, you know, with friends, simply because I never used to wear my glasses when I would go out, so I couldn't see anyone. So I'm like, I can't turn off my own because I don't know where you are. That's so good advice, actually, I, though. <laughs> number one, make sure you can see. Um, but I think, yeah, I think even I can come across quite extroverted, but I still get nervous when I turn up to places because you, and then until you've done something again and again and again, it is still new, it's still unknown territory, and, you know, for humans, we fear the unknown, just mm -hmm. how we're built. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's don't try to focus on the fact of you thinking you're the only one feeling that way. Um, yeah. a lot of people will be feeling that exact same way but just hide it but just, you know <laughs> basically you make it act like yeah, they, they don't share it and and that leads me on I wanted to ask you about the unique advantages of a women in tech network um, in terms of support mentorship collaboration and and you just kind of nailed it there like even if you're like you Lauren you're you're extroverted or you're Amy you might be a little bit more like I, I really don't the thought of going to a networking event terrifies me or whatever it may be you you, you might not um, feel natural in terms of connecting having that women in tech network that kind of bridges that gap doesn't it for everybody where you can feel um you can make connections and share similar stories and and hear those and hear the fact that everybody else in the room is probably thinking the same thing as you anyway you're right i think as well the reason it works really nicely is because it's a, a kind of general women in tech country group it's not a like a specific skill or a specific job type. You know, we, we have people that are like test leads or, you know, delivery managers or, um, CTI, you know, all, all different kind of jobs within the industry, knowing every, uh, people at different levels all have that same feeling, not just, you know, people in junior roles, people in mid role, people in, you know, mm -hmm. leadership roles. Everyone across the industry is in it together. Um, I think that was a really nice piece of it. it it's um and one one thing we wanted to get out of, you know whether people are just starting their career or they've had a career change or you know they've been doing it for i mean we had a lady that have been she, she'd been in tech for about like, 20 years mm -hmm. and she was like i would still wake up and worry you know is this right am i doing the right thing so yeah it, it just shows that i don't know if that's a good or a bad thing that you know it never goes away but <laughs> But like Amy said, you do just have to embrace it. And hey, you made it through that one day that you had imposter syndrome or that one day you worried mm -hmm. and you got through it. If it comes down again, you know, you can get through it again. So but I think we were also saying about um, 
obviously the shared experience this side of things so everyone's you think that you're the only person that's experienced a certain thing half the time you're not mm. we figured that out quite quickly when we started talking in that room but even when you get on to for example let's say the things that only happen to women let's talk about periods mm. You know, yeah, you want to sit in a room full of men in a meeting and be like, hang on a minute, I've just got to go mm, sort myself out, basically. Yeah. You know, you don't do that. But in like a room full of, obviously full of women, mm. they understand. They're like, actually, I need to work from home today. I need that flexibility because yeah. I have the worst pranks of yeah. my life, yeah. basically. Yeah. And having the openness to be able to actually have that conversation. So, mm. See, so period, we all have them, but there are other things, so endometriosis, yeah. like that, which are menopause as well. With mm. But you just don't talk about that mm. work. It's just still a taboo subject. It's very bizarre. It's very bizarre because it's something, especially like period, it's something that happens to everyone like all the time, but yet it's still considered very weird. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there are probably people listening to this, like, oh my God, she said the word. Very <laughs> taboo. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, it's very. But yeah, it's so it was it was a really it was really nice. And I think actually a lot of people made connections that day mm -hmm. and reached out and were hungry for the the next group. They wanted to meet people again and you know catch up with people and, and be like, oh, what did you do since the last the last talk? Like? Yeah, so we were saying um, potentially doing like one event school there, and then everyone's like, oh no, do you like and you do like one a month? Yeah, and you do like. I don't know, every few weeks. And we're like, oh, you know, whoa, okay, right now we've got to sort of things out, we've got to get rooms. And, but no, yeah, we, we were going to do remote ones. But yeah. we thought the need, the need, that's the, that's the thing. There's the need for in person women in tech groups. And that's that's definitely what we're shown by mm -hmm. the launch as well. Yeah. And the more you hear as well, the more it sparks an idea for somebody to try something new and and that's kind of how um this podcast started about just talking about the 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 taboo things that happen within the workplace but also just all the different careers because that inspires other ladies who most of the time haven't heard of all of the different things you can do and that you don't have to be technical. Well, I've had ladies on here tell me, you know what, I was in a role and somebody I knew described to me what a product manager was and that they worked in tech. And I thought I had to have a computer science degree and I had to be very technical. And I just didn't realize that when that person describes me everything that they did, I thought that's me, I'm already doing that. So why mm -hmm. wouldn't I just go and do that at a tech company? And mm -hmm. it's not until somebody talks about their role and shares with them what it's like, that it kind of, kicks off and inspires other people to to want to try something new and join the tech industry and and forums like that where you can meet and connect in person are just so much easier to to hear and to also figure out whether or not that lady genuinely loves her job because she can't hide that in person <laughs> if she's faking that <laughs> exactly and, and that was a um a big thing we discussed actually about the lot wasn't it about kind of role models what you're exposed to that kind of thing um and and seeing all of that and we discussed about people's experiences of getting into the industry and all that exactly like you said is that they could be doing that job already but not realizing it because it's called something else so yeah it's just it's just again having those open discussions yeah and i think going back to what you said it's not a case of oh i'm a woman in tech i'm a cto mm. i'm absolutely amazing you know, dog, this is my brand this is me i'm glamorizing it because it's not easy then <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure. it can be very lonely places. place as well. Exactly. Yeah, it would be. So, yeah, it's just situations are the same, but also different yeah. for different people. Yeah. So I think it's just a case of understanding what you're kind of looking to get out of a career mm. or just being a bit more open-minded. So, yeah, exactly what you said. A lot of the women that were at our event fell into tech, mm. including maybe pretty much all of our speakers, wasn't it, as yeah. well? So, yeah. yeah. I think going back to like the STEM stuff, I think I saw something a while ago and it said that in, um, I guess, like the lower paid communities, parents were asked, oh, um, do you think your children will end up in STEM careers? And they basically said no, because they didn't have the resources to do that. And I think that is because, for example, me growing up, I didn't have anyone in my family that had gone to university. I never even considered a career in tech, didn't even know that was open to me. I just thought, you know, a career in tech, the man sat in a hoodie, you know, yeah, coding, hacking, and that's yeah. it, what I've seen in movies. 
never realised I could actually do it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm not a software developer. I recruit for tech, but I understand it. And I think what you said about kind of the product management side of things mm-hmm. as well. So someone could be working at a shipping company doing all of these other different roles. And actually that translates fully mm-hmm. into the tech side, the implementation. And you're like, actually, I work in tech. But yeah, I mean, you, you also have, I guess, so, so my background is actually, I, I do photography, so I'm, I'm much more of a creative background. Tech roles, it's like UX and Y, mm-hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff that, I mean, I know people that do graphics and they don't ever really think that that can then transition into like UX and Y and all of that, but that is still in tech. It's, it's again, it's just having this understanding and having this exposure that you know what is achievable. Um, you know, we spoke about it lots about the involvement in schools and making kids aware of, of, of what is possible. Um, I think you said something, didn't you, about um, the advert that, yeah, I, I can't remember, it was one of the job boards, I can't remember which one it was, but um, I always say it sounds like it's not a bad joke, so bear with me, but it, it's in a school and it's um, a doctor, a firefighter and a pilot that walk into the classroom. Not a bad joke. Um, but they've all got face coverings on, so you can't tell to see what they look like. And the kids are asked to draw them. But eighty percent of the class draw them as male, and they're all female. And it shows it's it's you know these things that we're exposed to, whether that's cartoons or books or influencers. You know, with we're in the age that every child has a smartphone, pretty much everyone has like Instagram and TikTok and all of that. What they're exposed to it is. You know, so they, they learn so subconsciously from all of that. So we need to be about like role models and getting more people kind of um, actually into the industry. We said about, you know, the whole thing of um, thinking that coders were just what you see from movies. You know, yeah. it's all like this hoods up, black and like very dark rooms, and like super like, you know, hacking. And it, that's not how it works. <laughs> very much unconscious bias, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then you don't talk to anyone either because... That's it. So many ladies on here tell me, you know, it's nothing like that. Even if you are technical and you do code, you still have to report back to people and you have to report back to stakeholders and you, you have to be able to present and actually communicate what you're doing. It's not just you can just sit and not communicate with anybody and be, you know, completely antisocial, which That's is the stereotype. Not, yeah. And as I said, stereotypes are stereotypes for a reason. It's something that it, it would have come from. But that's not how everything is now. I mean, I went to um, when I went to one of the events in London. There was like a um, a makeup uh, brand, and they were trying to get people to obviously join for working in tech. And it's you wouldn't necessarily think that a makeup brand is a technical business, a tech like a technical job you go into. They oh, it would be like I don't know, like Intel or, or Amazon or IBM, you know, a typical kind of tech company. So I know every every kind of company needs tech in one way or the other. Because they have their infrastructure, they have their design, they have their digital e-commerce. Yeah, everything. So, and it's again, it's that I keep saying it. It goes back to the education piece of being like, it, it, what knowing what you can do in the tech industry, and, and you know, the, this whole um, podcast about networking and that. You can probably realize a lot of that from going and speaking to people and finding. So, for example, you're a student and you, you just you know your first year or something. But, at uni and you're like, I don't actually know where this is gonna end up. Give you a long list of places, you know, you can end up in long list of jobs, long list of companies. One woman that I played, um it was years ago mm. and she did her degree in psychology. Mm. And um she suddenly just started dabbling with tech. I think she had a few friends in it, didn't expect to kind of get a career out of it. Um, and she ends up going for a UX UI job and she was absolutely fantastic. Honestly, they were blown away with her in the interview because a lot of that is about how people perceive it, how people see it, what is yeah. user friendly, user yeah. experience. So having that psychology background into the person's mind, mm. really you know, great. Kind of, like you just don't get much better. Yeah. Um, completely. I think, yeah, it's just, that's it. it's just having that, yeah, that exposure of what you can yeah. do. Yeah, I know. Kidding. We say on here the 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 weirder the background and the squigglier the root as well. We we love to hear that because it does 
it just lets other ladies know that, you know, even if you are 10, 15 years into work, you can retrain at any time and try something new. And you're not starting from scratch. You're taking all of those wonderful skills that you have learned from just being in the workplace and moving them over to something else and retraining. So it's, you know, it's not seen as a disadvantage. Um, and the more ladies that we hear tell that story, the, the better it is for people um, to think, actually, I could do that. I could, I could learn to retrain and, and try a completely different career. Um, I, think it's, I was just going to say, in this day and age as well, you know, people do have the ability to do that. It's it's not kind of how it used to be where you'd have one job and that would be, you know, you'd work somewhere from school and then you're with them forever. You know, you there are so many options out there to retrain, like you said, um, to, to help you kind of get back like, all career changes or, you yeah. know, whatever. I think you don't even have to, have to do it as a career. I think sometimes, yeah, let's say, say you're, let's say I'm selling some like products that I've made, let's say some like hand soaps, mm. and I don't want to have to pay loads of money in the future for a website to be built. And I've just been dabbling on WordPress, for example. You know, you are working in tech while yeah. you are learning. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, we have spoken about this um, in terms of in person events. What about virtual events? How how do you do? You need to adapt your strategy. Do you have any advice if you're attending a virtual event? Is that harder to chip in and make a connection, maybe with someone? So I think I think definitely if you're going to go to like webinars and virtual events, it'd be good to have something you want out of it. So whether that's you're learning a new skill or whether that's um, you want to interact with someone or connect with them or ask questions, you know, I think you need to have a more so than I think going to an in-person event because I I find virtual ones can be slightly overwhelming. Um just just because of you I, I don't find you can have as much of a flow with virtual ones as you do in person. Um because you are essentially a box on screen. You're not you can't see you know the full body language. Mm-hmm. You can't um necessarily read or or have that you don't want to be talking over someone whereas when you're in person you've had you, you can get away with that bit because you're having that kind of conversation interaction. Um, so I think that's just something to be aware of. That's something I've done. Yeah, sort of done. It's harder to read body language, isn't it? I think mm-hmm. that is such a large piece of yes. doing yeah. yeah. in person. But yeah. I'm definitely more of an in-person event mm-hmm. kind of girl. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we used to it haven't we on screen but you're right you never quite pick up on somebody's body language unless you you are in person so yeah it's 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 very very different I suppose a mix of both virtual and in-person events can really help I think that's the thing I'll always if there's if there's um a, a remote kind of event that's a virtual one that's, that's worthwhile you know I always sign up to them because because I've noticed a lot of events now if you can't make it they'll still send you the recording so that's always really nice. So if you did want to learn from it at a later date, or for example, you want to go, but you, you can't, you know, you feel a bit overwhelmed, or you just it's just not not right for you, you can get that recording. Not not everyone does it, but some do, and that's really good. Um there's pros and cons to both. Really. There are. There are. Um, yeah, and I think I think the virtuals as well, it's um it's always it's like a time limit. When you're in person, you just you're there. You're just in that moment. Whereas when you've got a virtual event, you're like, it's an hour. I know it's going to be an hour. I've just got to give an hour of my time. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit more structured, mm. which is fine. You know, where I'm more of a free-flowing <laughs> kind of person. <laughs> yeah, a bit more relaxed. <laughs> Um, ladies, we are nearly out of time. I just wanted to ask quickly, do you have any final words of encouragement or advice for, for women that are navigating the, the tech networking landscape? Is there any anything that you wish someone had told you before you done it? Don't be scared. It's going to be fine. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, don't do it then, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> I wish someone had told um, me, don't do it. That's what we've reiterated already is that there's so many more women in tech than I think people maybe realise. Um, it's still obviously an issue, and there's still you know the, the gender gap there. But there are people there. There are people out there that have gone through it and they've succeeded. And you know, it it might not be right for you, but you've tried it. You know, it's I think like Amy said, don't be scared. You know, give it a go if you can. 
um, sign up to any any events or or follow people on LinkedIn or yeah, just that's it. Networking isn't just you know meeting people in person mm -hmm. face to face. If you're not comfortable doing that, you can do you know webinars, online seminars. If you're not comfortable doing that, you can literally just drop someone a message on LinkedIn or send an email. Mm -hmm. I don't know, just go to some columns or a discussion panel. There's so, so yeah. many things that, you know, it's not a one size fits all. You find what you feel comfortable with. And then, you know, you might actually find out, I prefer meeting in person, actually, mm. compared to the virtual, which has surprised me. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it is an element of it will be putting yourself out there and realising what you're comfortable with. So, you know, it's it seems scarier than it is. Um and you have to kind of trust that process, I guess. And then it's only gonna bring good things. Yeah, you put your toe in the water in the seawall part, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> and hey, if you're not comfortable, you know, with forums, carry a pigeon if you want. Um what air paper airplane to someone, whatever you feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah and and find your style um, and yeah. the ladies a brilliant advice to end it on and um, we are already there i could keep talking to you about this topic all afternoon um but thank you so much amy and lauren for joining me today and um, we would love to have you back at some point to follow up about plans with um, women in tech hampshire and, and and what you're doing um i know our community are going to absolutely love learning all about you so thank you so much for joining me today it's been a pleasure thank, thank you, you. And for everybody listening, as always, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again next time.